Thank you, Mr. President. May we be on the eighth order? Without objection, the Senate will be on the eighth order. Senator Carlisle. Thank you, Mr. President. This is for purposes of a floor amendment. The number is 13.8153.02002. Mr. President, what it does is uh, takes a 1.3 million uh, from the general fund for university system governance, and uh, some of us have uh, talked about this thing. So I, I decided we've got to bring it to the floor. I want to compliment uh, the senator from District 17. He's been open and fair and understands uh, about these amendments, and he knows this budget. But if you ref uh, refer on page 10. One line said we removed the university system office, the seven physicians. Then the next little uh, caveat, you add funding for system governance. Well, the 1.3 million given to the univers university office to me means uh, new FTEs. So uh, the amendment simply removes that 1.3 million. I ask for a verification vote and a green vote. Thank you. Are there any senators who do not have a, co who do not have a copy of the amendment proposed by Senator Carlisle. Any senators do not have a copy. Very well, any further, any discussion on the proposed amendment to Senate Bill 2003, which has already been amended? Senator Andrist. Well, Mr. President, members of the Senate, uh, it seems to me, and this is of deep concern to me, that we're going to be looking at two amendments to weaken the system that we have. The office of the uh, of the chancellor and the power of the board of higher education. I want to concentrate most of my comments on the second one, but it seems to me that uh, this is another step uh, to what I like to say neuter the system that we've got, and it re deeply concerns me. I think we should reject the amendment. Any further discussion on the proposed amendment to Senate Bill 2003? which has already been amended. Hearing none, we will proceed by way of verification vote. The question being the proposed amendment numbered 13.8153.02002 uh, question being on that proposed amendment to Senate Bill 2003 would the secretary please open the key for a verification vote. All senators have voted. Would the secretary please close the key? The nays have it. The amendment is rejected. Returning to the 11th order, Senate Bill 2003 as previously amended. Senator Grinberg. Mr. President, may we remain on the 8th order? Without objection, the Senate will be on the 8th order. Senator Grinberg. Mr. President, I move Amendment 02001 that I believe everybody should have on their desk. Are there any senators who do not have the amendment numbered as Senator Grinberg just stated? Point zero two zero zero one. Senator Grinberg. Mr. President, the um, amendment that um, has been followed in the media for some time now is before the Senate for consideration. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, Legislative Council has tied in the constitutionality with the language, but in essence, it provides $854,520 in the event the State Board chooses to seek a settlement agreement with, as it's listed here, the Commissioner or Chancellor of Higher Education. Mr. President, members of the Senate, you will also find that the amendment um, if passed, reduces month by month of the biennium a pro rata, pro rata amount of $35,605. So in essence, Mr. President, at the end of the biennium, if this is not used, the general fund will be replenished with the appropriation amount in this bill. And Mr. President, if I get a second, I'll continue. Mr. President, that in essence is the uh, uh, basis and the intent of the amendment. And I would like to explain my position on the amendment. Mr. S President, members of the Senate, I find it somewhat uh, humbling and ironic that I'm standing in the 
position that a former colleague spent 46 years in this body. It was that very same senator who provided sound leadership in 1999 to move forward with a new vision for higher education in North Dakota. Some of the things missing in the 1990s for those that were here was constant discussion about accountability and funding for our 11 campuses in the state. The relationship between the Higher Education Board, the system and the legislature, and the leadership of a man that stood here led to a report that was adopted over a two-year period during the 2001 legislative session. The report, a summary or a presentation, if you will, I sent to the body here earlier today. And for those of you that have taken the chance to look at those slides, on slide one, the key words are creating a shared vision for higher education in the state of North Dakota. I want to stress a shared vision for the state. Mr. President, I also want to be on record that my interest and my concern does not reflect the great work of our fine faculty and our fine staff at our 11 campuses located across our great state that comprise 48,000 students. We have a fine system of higher education in North Dakota. I beg to argue with anyone that thinks otherwise. Mr. President, 12 years ago, we adopted a report, a plan, a vision, a shared vision for higher education. I had the privilege of serving on a 61-member panel during that time, and I can tell you there were key words of trying to bring the private sector, the legislature, and the institutions and community leadership to one common vision, a shared vision. The words trust were used over and over and over again during that two-year period. Honesty, the desire for strong campus leadership, campus leadership with presidents who could be entrepreneurial, take risk, and be part of the state's economic future by growing our communities and our state. It was a public-private partnership model that worked very, very well. In that report were six cornerstones. The first cornerstone I had the privilege of chairing, the economic development connection of our campuses to our state's economy. I can tell you that every campus over this 12-year period has been engaged with their local economic development offices and making a difference, whether it's providing training, responding to workforce needs, and in the best ability, changing curriculum to meet the demands of the future. I firmly believe that. The second was educational excellence. How do we strengthen the educational excellence of our state's 11 campuses and universities? As a couple of examples of ongoing legislative commitment of that, a few years ago, we adopted rigor, advanced rigor in K-12 education that was led by the legislature that will produce outcomes with higher quality students with more preparation for college as well as implemented a scholarship program for our students to continue that track of educational excellence. The third was responsible and flexible. The call was to make sure our campuses could be flexible and responsive. The fourth was accessible. If I remember in the early the late 1990s, we had some, somewhere around 25% of our students taking courses online. The premise of the roundtable on accessibility was online education and growth. Today, I think the number is somewhere around 50% of our students, whether they're on campus or taking a course from their home, are involved in an open and accessible system. The fifth was funding and rewards. And we continue to have challenges and determine what are the best methods of funding and rewards. And clearly, what's been advanced this session in a separate bill um, has made a significant difference, and I believe will have finally achieved some of the concerns around funding and rewards 12 years later. Mr. President, members of the Senate, the sixth cornerstone, which is the premise of today's debate that was talked about when this report was adopted, 
was sustaining the vision for what we created in 2001. I can tell you that I have a lot of personal pride as one member of this body who contributed to that overall success and movement of this report that was called, is called the Roundtable of Higher Education. And I know many of you have that feeling as well. In fact, this program has been so successful it's been recognized twice with national awards on the performance and the, the, the process, the bringing people together working together on a shared vision. Two awards were given. In fact, equally in the state, three newspapers commented on the roundtable approach put higher education in this state on a new course that almost everyone approves. Second newspaper, our opinion, add college to the basket of North Dakota goods. Sound plan. And finally, another headline, the Higher Education Roundtable got it right. Mr. President, in the spring of 2012, the State Board of Higher Education, by a vote of five to three, hired a new chancellor. Numerous policy changes were made in a short period of time to empower one individual to advance as what we've come known, has become known as the pathway success model. Clearly, this rapid movement is a 180 degree turn of what we largely experienced with our shared vision plan that was adopted in 2001. Some members of the board argue this is what the legislature asked for. I was not asked my opinions other than one short overview in an interim higher education meeting. Were you asked? They also advocated more control over the North Dakota University system campuses. Two recent events are often cited why change and more control is needed where events largely driven by hubristic leadership. From the people I have talked to, this sounds very familiar to where we're going today. Mr. President, in June of last year, I was quoted in a preeminent, quoted in a preeminent national higher education newspaper that said the following regarding the naming of our new chancellor. The new chancellor will have to balance his desire to regulate the institutions more heavily with the needs of the individual colleges. The chancellor has no constituency base. He's going to have to set a vision and not come across heavy handed. Those were my quotes last June in a national higher education newspaper that called and wanted my insight on the decisions. Mr. President, clear this is not what has transpired. Conversations with former and current NDUS North Dakota University System, North Dakota University System employees, students, citizens, and legislators clearly indicate there's a major problem with the changing culture and leadership coming out of the university system office. Further, the North Dakota Student Association has clearly, carefully researched the issues at hand, and this past weekend, as everyone is aware, express their concerns in an open and democratic process. Their decisions and process was not taken lightly from what I understand, and their decisions are unprecedented in the state of North Dakota. Mr. President, what this amendment is and is not. It is not about college presidents not reporting to a chancellor. They are now and they always should. What this amendment is about is providing an environment of trust, respect, and a system office leadership that moves us all forward, and in my opinion, which should be defined as a shared vision. It is about a desire to return to a shared vision for higher education. This amendment allows us, allows us to do what's right for the 48,000 students who we represent, and this amendment just provides an option in the future to change course to avert any major damage if things continue on the track that they are on. Mr. President, I would like to thank the Chairman of the Appropriations Committee and members of the committee that I serve with for their understanding of me choosing not to run this through the Appropriations Committee, uh, but bringing it to the floor. 
because I feel strongly enough that everyone should have the opportunity to debate this in this forum. Mr. President, I welcome questions and your thoughtful consideration about this important vote for the future of higher education in North Dakota. And Mr. President, I request a verification vote. Continuing on with further discussion on the proposed amendment to Senate Bill 2003, Senator Andrist. Mr. President, members of the Senate, we've seen a tremendous evolution taking place in our higher education system over the years and over my lifetime. Some of it good and some of it problematic. If we go way back at one time, we saw the situation where the legislature wanted to run the higher education system and that the situation became so problematic that we created the Board of Higher Education as a constitutional authority to run the system. Ultimately, moving forward to decide that that system should have a chancellor. Now, my friends in the Senate, Think of what we're doing to structure if we pass this amendment. We have just gone through the process of sh shredding the system on so many issues related to intervening with the chancellor. We've seen the same community from which this effort is coming get rid of the last chancellor. And now we're seeing an effort to get rid of the new chancellor not for anything he's done, but for his vision for how the office should be run. And a lot of us, I hope, still feel that we need a strong system and a strong chancellor and a strong board of higher education. Because one thing that has changed is at one time we had much more diverse representation geographically in this body, and now because of uh, our court rulings, we're concentrating more and more of our power in the population centers. And I'm wondering if we really want to give the power of, 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 of population to running the higher education system. The Board of Higher Education is much more diverse. I think we make a, a dreadful mistake if we take, if we now assume the power that we might have or might not have to tell a board of higher education what they should be doing when it's something they don't want to do, for the first time we have a chancellor, for the first time that I can remember, we have a chancellor and a board which are solidly focusing on system, right or wrong. It's structure, and it's the kind of structure our system needs. And I hope you'll reject this amendment and give this a chance to work and play out before we start interfering with the constitutional power of the Board of Higher Education. Any further discussion? Senator Anderson. Mr. President, I'm going to support this amendment for this reason. I think that the people who hire an individual ought to have the ability to fire them. Now, it seems to me like if uh, the Board of Higher Education decided to fire the chancellor, they would have to come to us and ask us for the money to buy out his contract. This amendment assures that they don't have to do that. It doesn't say that they have to fire him or not have to fire him, but it assures them that they have the money if they want to do that. Now, uh, at some point, the legislature has to decide if they want a Board of Higher Education and a chancellor to run the university system, or if they want to run it themselves. And this constant back and forth is not particularly productive, I don't think. But the Board of Higher Education ought to have, at any time they want to, the ability to fire the chancellor and not have to come to us and ask for the money. So this gives them the money should they decide they want to do that. Thank you. Any further discussion on the proposed amendment to Senate Bill 2003, Senator Triplett? Mr. President, I just wanted to um, respond to two of the comments from um, my good friend from District 2. Um, he said that um, 
the chancellor has been criticized for his vision. And while that may be true that some people have criticized him for his vision, um, I think that's not true across the board. I actually have sat through a number of presentations of the, the chancellor's vision for improvements, and I think there are an enormous number of good ideas in what has been presented. I do not criticize him for his vision or the vision of the board and what they are trying to do. I do, however, criticize the chancellor and the board, and I'm not exactly sure which came first, the chicken or the egg here, um, and so it's hard to lay blame because I wasn't there at the meetings. But I have reviewed um, the, the minutes of all the meetings of the State Board of Higher Education for more than the last year as we've been in this transition period, and I have been quite disturbed in, in reading that to see the number of policies that have been changed very quickly without adequate comment from people in the system, especially the presidents. And that's my concern. It's not the vision, it's the process and the speed with which these changes are taking place that have not allowed for input from the relevant stakeholders, university and college presidents, faculty, staff, and students need to be heard before policies are changed. And that is not um, mutually exclusive with the idea of establishing a better and stronger role for the system. So I think we need to be clear. Some of us are, are not criticizing the vision. We're criticizing the rapidity with which change has been made and the feeling um, on the part of uh, people inside the universities that their jobs are on the line if they comment on changes that have been made. And that is no way to run a system which is supposed to be a shared vision and a, sh a collaborative process. So I am in support of this amendment, um, but I just wanted to clarify that point. Is there any further discussion on the proposed amendment to Senate Bill 2003? Senator Krebsbach. Mr. President, we have 48,833 students in this state and 11 institutions. And these folks voted for us to do exactly what is being proposed by the Senator from District 41 to do today. I have great faith in the young people of this state and I know that they seriously reviewed this matter. They heard both sides. They interviewed the chancellor. They also interviewed the proponent of this measure. And they very diligently did their homework and came to the conclusion they did. Mr. President, I vote with my students in the state of North Dakota on this measure. Senator Miller. Uh, Mr. President, I asked for information from the students that voted on this uh, details of why they have this consternation with the chancellor and I have yet to receive that information. I wanted to, I wanted to see documented individual details and I have not seen that. What I have seen is that at one particular university they have a 15% four-year completion average. Now tell me we don't have a problem in this state. And I think our chancellor is trying to get his hands wrapped around the issue and he's trying to do it in quick fashion. Now I'm not saying he hasn't probably upset some people and could have done things a better way, but we're asking to ab adopt an amendment that has $854,000 in it and he's asking for some help to uh, try and do his job with some new FTEs, but we won't give him that, but we'll give him a bunch of, a big golden parachute. And I just don't think that adds up. Let's give him some time. Let's let him correct his mistakes. Let him work out his plan. Further discussion? Senator Holmberg. Uh, Mr. President, uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank the, the Senator from District 41 for bringing this issue before us because I think it is an important issue that should be and uh, was appropriately brought to the floor of the Senate. I sense, uh, listening to the good Senate from District 1 and District 18 and District 10 and, I uh, can't remember yours, but anyway, why not, 
um, 40, um, that I get this idea, I keep thinking back to Goldilocks. Uh, some say it's too hot, some say it's too cold, and we're trying to find out what is just right for a chancellor. Uh, I do not disagree with the senator from District 18, but was sitting remembering that in 2007 interim, uh, when we talk about speed of change within higher education, we wanted to make changes regarding math placement tests at our campuses. We found out that at the 11 campuses, there were 11 different testing procedures to find out what math class you should be in. And it was very confusing for those of us who were high school counselors or whatever because of that issue. Some schools required ACT math score. There was a school that required just the ACT composite score there were others that had a combination of this, that, and their own test. That was in the interim of 2007. The implemented change is starting this year. That to me, Mr. President, was an example of going too slow. Now, uh, some of these changes that are being talked about and, uh, are very good. They're very good for students. And uh, I agree with the senator from 41 when he talks about our focus needs to be on the students and the faculty and what's going on on the campuses. My concern about this issue is our role as the legislative branch. We don't determine through amendments who is going to be the director of human services, even if we don't like him or her. We don't have any authority over who that person is. The only authority we have is the authority of the purse. So, Mr. President, I, I certainly welcome the opportunity that we've had here to discuss the issue publicly, and whatever happens, happens. But, Mr. President, I'm just uncomfortable voting to suggest that a, uh, a member of a branch of, a, a branch of government, not a separate branch, but uh, certainly in the minds of some an equal branch, um, that we should be setting the agenda for his removal when we have zero, nada, no authority to remove that individual. Any further discussion on the proposed amendment to Senate Bill 2003? Senator Grinberg. Well, Mr. President, just to remind the body, this amendment's about the purse. It isn't about our decision to remove. Further discussion? Hearing none, we'll proceed by way of verification vote at the request of Senator Grinberg. Question being on the proposed amendment to Senate Bill 2003. The secretary, please open the key for a verification vote. All senators have voted. Any senator wishing to change their vote? Secretary, close the key. The nays have it. The amendment is rejected. Returning to the 11th order, Senate Bill 2003 as pre-